This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Thank you so much, uh, Rabbi Tabak, for uh, arranging this trip and helping making it possible. Uh, the Kehila is very fortunate to have a Tamil Chacham of Rabbi Tabak's caliber, raising up the level of Torah and Avoida, and we'd like to be Mavarechim and his family, that he should have many successful years uh, together with the Kehila of uh, Lahagdo Torah Ladira. So over the past short time, I had the privilege to meet some of uh, our, my good friends uh, from South Africa. I see my friend uh, Neil here and Jonathan. I want to thank uh, Ilan for uh, taking us around today. Actually, he took us to one of the gold mines. And it's quite interesting that uh, South Africa and Johannesburg has one of the richest deposits of gold anywhere in the world. And I couldn't help but think, you know, there's a principle that everything in the physical world really parallels the spiritual universe. universe. So if uh, South Africa is such a repository of Zahav, of gold, in the physical world, that must mean that the spirituality and the holy neshamas that are here are unparalleled anywhere in the world as well. And uh, that's something that I'm coming to see firsthand. Thank you so much for having me. So the three weeks, the Shalosh Shavuos, the three weeks, how many days exactly are in the three weeks? The title of the shir is called Flying Letters, which coming off of a plane, actually all the letters to me seem like they're flying off the page. How many days are in the three weeks? We usually call it the three weeks. Is that really an apt description for this period of the year? So we learned that last Shabbos, the beginning of Sefer Yirmiyahu, Parak Aleph, and it was the word of God to me saying, What do you see? What do you see? Actually, I got a Shiloh today. Somebody in America texted me. I have, a, I have an unlimited plan. So someone texted me. He davened in a shul last Shabbos, where it was Parshas Pinchas, and the Balkari, not realizing that it was the three weeks, lain the Haftarah of Parshas Pinchas, about Elio Anovi, didn't lain. Divrei Yermio ben Chilkiyahu. So what should be done next Shabbos? So actually it's one of the rare exceptions. Very good. That, la- give this man a cigar. Okay. So it's one of the rare exceptions that next week's Haftarah is Parak Beis of Yermiyahu. Right? The acronym is Dashach. Shimu Dvar Hashem is Parak Beis of Yermiyahu. So if you miss one of the Haftarahs of the Shal Shavuos, or the Shiva Dinechemta, there's a Tshuva in the Tzemach Tzedek, that you'll actually have to make it up next week, because it's a rear Haftarah which is legislated by, uh, I believe the Psikta, it's legislated by, uh, by the Tar Shabbat Peh. Okay, be it as it may, so last week's Haftarah begins where the Rebbe says, What do you see, Yermiyahu? Vo'imar makel shoket aniroya. I see a blossoming almond branch. Makel shoket. A staff blossoming with almonds. Vayerma Hashem Eli, Hashem said to me, Hey, Taf de you see good. Ki shoiket ani al devari la soisoi, I am diligent, I will be diligent to carry out, to carry out my edict. Rashi points out that what's the comparison between the shoiket, the almond branch, and this period of the year? Says Rashi, the shoiket, the almond branch, is memaher lahoitzi parakodim cholilonois? Is the swiftest producing fruit of all the fruits that exist? The one that produces fruit the quickest is the almond brand, the almond tree. And therefore, what the Rebbeinu Shlom is saying is, I'm not going to tarry. I'm not going to wait. Even though I said the noishantem ba'aretz, even though I said it's going to take a long time until I punish you, the punishment is coming very quickly. But then Rashi brings the medrash agada. Rashi says. That if you're familiar with the way that the almond grows, it actually takes 21 days from Chanata, from the time that it blossoms, until it's fully ripened. Says Rashi, that is communion the days, that is the same number of days as the days between Shiva Asar Batamos and Tishabav. And therefore, R- Rashi is pointing out to us that the Rivon Shalom is telling Yirmiya Anavi that this is not just an analogy, a general analogy, this is not an allegory, there's a very specific example that I'm giving you. That this period of the year, the period of Peronius, the period of punishment, is exactly like an almond tree. An almond tree, it takes 21 days to grow. Likewise, this time of the year is 21 days, three weeks. 
By the way, there's another source that this time of the year is 21 days. This is a Gemara that all the Balei, all the Darshanim all speak about this Gemara. The Gemara talks about the conversations and the debate between Rabbi Yeshua ben Chananya and the Chachmei Atuna. Rabbi Yeshua ben Chananya and the, the sages of Athens, the, the wise men of Athens, the heretics of Athens. And it's interesting that throughout Shas, just as an aside, who is always selected to debate the Chachmei Atuna or to debate the Maskilim or the Minim or the Apikarsim? The best candidate, the one who they're always sending is Rabbi Shua ben Hananya. By the way, it always struck me, who is this Rabbi Shua ben Hananya? That he's always debating the Api Karsam. He must be this really educated, worldly person who has such broad background that he's able to converse and debate the Api Karsam. <laughs> one thing we know about Rabbi Shua ben Hananya is that, what, what does it say in Perkei Avais? That Rabbi Yoichanam ben Zakai said about Rabbi Shua ben Hananya, what? Ashrei fortunate is his mother. And the Mepharshim bring down a tradition that we have, that from the time that this, this little boy was young, his mother would wheel him into the Beis HaMedrash so that as soon as the first, the first music, the first sound that he would hear would be the sound of Torah. This is an individual who had no exposure whatsoever to anything other than pure, unadulterated Torah. He's the only one who could debate the Chach Atuna. Just the opposite of what you would have thought. You know, we, we're not so into these uh, ecumenical debates or these, these types of uh, discussions and dialogue because we don't have people, the character of Yeshua ben Hananya, who are so fully immersed in Torah. If somebody's not fully immersed in Torah, they're not necessarily qualified to be able to have a dialogue. Maybe they'll be influenced. Maybe they'll be affected by such a discussion. We need someone like Rabbi Shua ben Hananya, who Ashrei Yoyladetai, all his ears ever heard, were the pure words of Torah. Be it as it may, one of the very difficult, perplexing questions they, they posed to Rabbi Shua ben Hananya was, here it is, you have two chickens. You have a black chicken, you have a white chicken, and they both produce white eggs. How is that possible? Seems like an odd question. It's and What exactly was the question? So the Marsha says, there's something unique about the egg. The egg takes how many days to develop? 21 days to develop. And you could have a black chicken and a white chicken, and they both produce 21, an uh, egg that takes 21 days to develop. That corresponds to two periods on our calendar that are exactly 21 days. What are they? From Rosh Hashanah till Hashanah Rabbah is 21 days, right? We say Hashanah, na is 51, 51 days from the beginning of Elul until Hashanah Rabbah. And then the other 21 days are the three weeks. And the question is, how could it be that from one God emanates 21 Yimei HaRachamim and 21 Yimei HaParaniyos? How is it possible? that This was a question about God's unity. How could from one God come 21 days of punishment and 21 days of mercy? And the answer is, the Marsha explains, what Rabbi Shua ben Hanania told them was both of these 21 day periods are mechaper, the avoinois of Klal Yisrael, and bring the Jewish people closer to HaKadosh Baruch but what I would like to bring out from here is that what item in the, uh, in the world represents this period of the year, the three weeks, the egg. Why the egg? Because it takes 21 days for the egg to develop. So here you have two analogies to the three weeks. Number one, the makel shaked, the almond tree, which takes 21 days to develop. And number two, the egg, which takes 21 days to develop. The Arizal also says, if you look at number four in the Shar HaKavanos, the Arizal says that during the Bein HaMetzarim, which are 21 days between Shavu Asabatamas and Tishabav, the Arizal says it's a proper minog to sit during uh, midpoint of the day, Ba'avelos, and to cry over the Chorban Abayis. But I just want, want, want to bring out from the Arizal is Arizal also gives the number 21. So you have the Makel Shake 21, you have the eggs 21, you have the Arizal 21. The problem is, you know, if you've ever graduated second grade ma- mathematics, you would know that in three weeks there are not 21 days. We all know there are 22 days in the three weeks. Because whatever day Shiva Asabatamas is, the same day of the week is Tishabav. 
So if this year, Shabbos Sabbatama is a Shabbos Sunday, Tishbab is Shabbos to Sunday. So it doesn't require, you know, it's not, not rocket science to figure out that it's 22 days. It's three weeks plus a day. So all of these sources that say the three weeks are 21 days, they're all off by one. I know in Gematria you're allowed to be off by one, but it, it would seem that we're not dealing with a Gematria over here. We're using examples in the physical world. We're using the example of the Makel Shaket, the almond tree, which is 21 days, the egg, which is 21 days. Why do we keep on referring to the three weeks as 21 days when in fact they're 22 days? And by the way, the concept that the three weeks are 22 days is very, very significant. There's a lot of importance in the number 22. The Bnei Yisachar, for example, writes that he says, every hour in the three weeks is precious. How many hours are in the three weeks? So he says, well, there are 22 days in the three weeks. 24 hours a day. That's how many hours in the three weeks? 528 hours. He's using the number 22. What's the significance of 528? Mafteach, key. Key is 528. Meaning the key to the geula is something which equals 528. You know what that is? Do you know how many prakim there are in Shas? Do you know how many prakim there are in Shisha Sidre Mishnah? Says in Megala Amukais, there are 528 prakim in Shisha Sidre Mishnah. To teach you that the key to the Geula, the key to redemption, is the mastery of the Tarsh of Alpeh, the 528 Prakim. In fact, the Bnei Soschar asks that if you count, there are only 523. Rabbi Shaya Berlin, in his Agois on Shas, writes, there are only 523 Prakim in Shas. So what does Megala Mukais mean that there are 528 Prakim? So the Bnei Soschar writes, no, it's all true, it's, it's accurate. You see, there are 523 Prakim of Mishnah, and there are an additional five prakim in uh, Shas that are added that are not technically Mishnayas. So for example, the fourth parak of Bikurim is not technically a Mishnah. The last parak of Avais is Shanu Chachamenu Balashana Mishnah Tzabraisa. You have Toisefta added to Psachim. You have a Toisefta added to Kedushin. And you have Toisefta added to Saita. So really you have 523 Prakim of Mishnah. An additional 5 Prakim either of Toisefta or Brisa. 528 because the key of Geula is the Mafteach is the 528 Prakim of Shas. Like the Medrash tells us. Gam ki yitnu bagoyim ein hagoliois miskansois ela bishvil hamishnah. It's an amazing thing. If you look in the Mishnah at the end of Tainus, the Mishnah talks about the five tragedies that occurred on Shavas or Batamos. So what are they? Well, we know Nishtabra HaLuchais. The Luchais were broken. That was the first one. Moshe Rabbeinu comes down and he shatters the Luchais. And as we're going to see, when he shattered the Luchais, the Medrash tells us in a number of places, the letters flew off the Luchais. Don't forget about that. And then the Mishnah says, Batal HaTamid, the carbon Tamid, stop being brought. And then the Mishnah says, Vahufka Ha'ir, the walls of the city were breached by the second base of Mikdash. Vissaraf Apostomus is HaTayra, Apostomus burnt the Tayra. And then, Vehemid Selim Behechal, they erected a, an Avodah in the Hechal. And the Archlaner asks, you know, it's very interesting that these five tragedies happened all on Shavas Batamas. Hey, what's it got to do with my life? Okay, who, I, 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 didn't, I didn't tell Moshe to break the Luchos. I told him to break the Luchos. If I would have told him to break the Luchos, then I understand that I should fast on Shavas Batam. I put up the Tzalem in the Hechal. I didn't put up no Tzalem in the Hechal. If I would have been there, I would have stopped him. Why do I need to fast because of all these tragedies that happen? And it seems like a, quite a random string of tragedies. First of all, think about the timeline of it. Moshe broke the Luchos. In the Midbar, the carbon Tamid was broke, it was ceased. It's Machloikis, it was a bias Rishon, it was a bias Sheni. The walls of the city were opened up, were breached, bias Sheni. Apostomus burnt the Torah. The Tzelem was put in the Hechal, according to some, was bias Rishon. It, se- it seems like a random order of tragedy. And the Aruch Lener says, quite frighteningly, and quite powerfully, that this Mishnah is giving us the key to Jewish demise and destruction. In other words, these are not five random tragedies. These are five tragedies that repeat themselves throughout history 
And these are, th these are ideas and concepts that we have to think about in our own life. Says the Aruch Laner, the, this is the five-step downward spiral of the Jewish people. It all starts with Nishtabru Haluchais. It all starts when the commitment to regular study of the Torah breaks. That's the beginning of the end. Yeah, a person maybe was committed to learning or wishes they were committed to learning. The moment the commitment is slightly broken, then what happens next? Batal Hatamid. The daily service of God seems, starts to slip away. First it starts with maybe Marev with a minion or Mincha with a minion. Maybe then it goes to Tuesday and Wednesday. And then just the regular daily Avodah Hashem ceases. That's Batal Hatamed. And once the daily service of God ceases, then the city has been breached. Who's the city? The Gemara tells us that the person is the city. We are the city. We are the Ir Katana. We are the small city with very few guards. And once we pray, once our city is open, we are prayed to the Yetzirah, and the Yetzirah comes and burns down the Torah, and then a generation or two later, when you see, instead of the Magin David dangling around the neck, when you see a different symbol, you can know you could always trace it back to Nishtabru Haluchais. It starts very innocuously. It starts with Nishtabru Haluchais. It starts with a slackening off in Limar HaToyra. Then goes the daily service of Hashem. Then we're open pray. Therefore, we understand why there are 528 hours in the three weeks. Because in order to rectify the problem of Nishtabru Haluchais, where the Luchais were broken and the commitment to Limar HaToyra slackened off, we need 528 hours to rededicate ourselves to the prakim of Shishit Sidre Mishnah. You know, there's a well-known gematria of Rabbi Yosef Chaim Zunnenfeld that when he said this gematria, the brisk Rav said, he said it Baruch HaKodesh. The Pasuk says, we're going to lean it on Tisha B'Av, on Shabbos Chazoyin, Tziyoyin b'mishpat tipadeh v'shaveha Bitsadaka. Tsiyain will be redeemed with justice and her captives will be returned Bitsadaka. Says Rabbi Yosef Chaim Zanafeld. Tsiyain Bemishba Tipada is Gamatria Talmud Yushalmi. Vishaveha Bitsdaka is Gamatria Talmud Bavli. In other words, that's what it takes. That's what, it, that's what it all boils down to. The rededication and the recommitment to repair what started on Yedzayin Batamas, which is Nishtaber Haluchais. Okay, coming back to the question, friends. Everybody's saying there are 21 days in the three weeks. The problem we just said, the Bnei Yisosra, there are 22 days times 24 hours, the 528 hours. You could count them, there are 22 days. Why is everybody referring to the three weeks as 21 days? Well, there must, there's a missing day. There's a missing day in the three weeks. There must be one day that doesn't seem to count. And you would have to say that if there's one day that doesn't count, by the way, one more item, the Arizal writes, now I'm not saying you, you should do this, or we're on the level to do this, but just be aware that during the three weeks, when you say the first blessing of Shemana Esrei, and you say the name of Hashem, you should think about the letters that precede the name of Hashem. So if you take God's name, Yud, then a He, and then a Vav, and then a K, the letters that precede the Yud, K, Vav, K, are what? Tes, Dalid, He, Dalid. Yeah? Tes, Dalid, Hey, Dalid. Tes and Dalid is 13. Hey and Dalid is 9. A total of how many? 22. Ah! Oh, the 22 days of the three weeks, says Arizal. Why are they alluded to in the letters before God's name? Because the, the days of the three weeks are very hidden days. They're Nistar, they're Nelam. They're almost ignored. There's something about them that has not been brought out yet. There's a latent potential in these days that are nelam. They're the letters before the yud kei vav kei. Tes dalid, hey dalid. Tes dalid is what? Thirteen. Those are the thirteen days of Tammuz. From yud zayin b'tammuz until the end of the month. It's, uh, Tammuz is always chaser, twenty-nine days. Hey dalid are, are nine. Those are the nine days of av. 
So here that Rizal is saying there are 22 days in the three weeks. By the way, that Rizal says an incredible thing. Tes Dalid are the Yud Gimel Midoy Sarachamim. He Dalid are the nine Midoy Sarachamim. What does that mean, 13 Midoy Sarachamim, nine Midoy Sarachamim? There are 13 Midoy Sarachamim that Moshe Rabbeinu davened after he broke the Luchais. After he broke the Luchais, that Hashem, Hashem, Kel Rachem, Achan, Anar, Chavar, Malchaz, Yemes. But after the Chid HaMiraglim by Tishabav, he only invoked nine of the Midoy Sarachamim. So the 13 days of Tammuz correspond to the 13 Midos Harachamim that Moshe Rabbeinu invoked after Yud Zayin B'Tammuz, after the Shviras Haluchos. And the 9 days of Av correspond to the 9 Midos Harachamim that Moshe Rabbeinu invoked by, after the Chid HaMaraglam. But here that Rizal is saying, 22. So what's this number 21? Which day are we not counting? So you would think... It's most reasonable to say that we all know that even though Tisha B'Av is such a tragic day, on the other hand, there's this dichotomy that Tisha B'Av is considered a mayid. It's even brought in Shulchan Aruch. We don't say Tachnon on Tisha B'Av. The Pasuk says, Kara Olai Mayid Lishbar Bachurai. So Tisha B'Av is this mayid, it's a yamtif, and therefore maybe Tisha B'Av doesn't really fully make, uh, make the bill of being part of the three weeks. And therefore, when we say the number of days in the three weeks, we're not including Tisha B'Av. If Pinchas Karatzer explains that everything good in this world has to first be broken down completely for it to develop and come to full fruition. He says an egg, an egg sort of uh, decomposes and then regenerates. A seed, a seed decomposes and then sprouts for- forth. So too, in order to have the binyan bayis hashlishi, we had to have the destruction of the Beis Hamikdash two times on Tishabav, so that ultimately it would be rebuilt on Tishabav. But that's odd that the most tragic day on the calendar shouldn't count. Here you have 22 days. The first 21 days we're going to count. But I get it, Tisha B'Av is a moyed, it's somewhat of a yomtif, but it shouldn't be part of the three weeks when we talk about the 21 days. Why are we not counting Tisha B'Av? If you examine Megillah Seicha, what time do I have till? 40. 40? you examine Megillah Seicha, we know there are five prakim. Parak Aleph, how many psukim in Parak Aleph? 22 psukim by the letters of the Aleph Beis. How many psukim in Parak Beis? 22 psukim by the letters of, Al- of the Aleph Beis. How many psukim in Parak Gimel? 66 psukim, the Aleph Beis, three times. How many psukim in Parak Dalid? 22 psukim. So the Gemara asks, why are there 22 psukim in Eicha? Every parak is uh, 22 kenege the Aleph Beis. Says the Gemara, why were they punished with Eicha Kenegah the Aleph Beis, number 12? Because they violated the Torah that was given with the Aleph Beis. The Maral says something incredible. Oyem Benoira says the Maral that we know the first base Hamikdash was destroyed because of the big three. Avoy Dezara, Gili Arayos, Shvichas Damim. Those are big, big Averas. The second base Hamikdash was destroyed because of Sinas Chinam. Now Sinas Chinam Maybe in it of itself, a one-time violation, maybe you can make the case it's somewhat minor. After all, there's no malchus, there's no lashes. Lashes are not ordained for somebody who violates an aschino. There's no, it's not punishable by death. But it's a type of Avera, the Rabbeinu Yana writes, you repeat it, you repeat it, you repeat it, you repeat it. It's like one a thread that's repeated again and again and again. It becomes a very thick rope. The Maral says... Perak Aleph, Perak Beis, and Perak Dalid of Megillah Seicha. The Pesukim are very, very long. Perak Gimel, which has three Aleph Beises, the Pesukim are very short. They're very short. Very short Pesukim. Some of them you don't even have an Asnach Damil the Pasuk. Maral says, very simple. The the Parak Aleph, Parak Beis, and Parak Dalid all begin with the word Eicha. Eicha. What's the gematria of Eicha? 36. Parak Gimel does not begin with the word Eicha. Parak Gimel begins with the word Ani Hagever, Ra Ani. Why? Why do Parak Aleph, Beis, and Dalid begin with the word Eicha and Parak Gimel not begin with the word Eicha? 
The Gemara in Krisa says, why were we punished with the word Eicha? Because we violated the 36 Chayavei Krisais. We violated all 36 sins that we could uh, be liable to that terrible death penalty. By the way, during which base Hamikdash did we violate the 36 Krisais? First base Hamikdash. The Gemara says they violated Abed Zara, Gilead Raya, Shvichas Damim. Second base Hamikdash, they didn't violate the Chayavei Krisais. Second base Hamikdash, it was only Sinas Chinam. So the Maral says incredibly, Perak Aleph that begins with Eicha, Perak Beis that begins with Eicha, Perak Dale that begins with Eicha, correspond to the first Beis HaMikdash. The first Beis HaMikdash, they violated the big three, the big three Chayav Ekrisais. Therefore, there are three Prakim for Chorben Bayes Rishain. And the Psukim are long, long Psukim, because the Averos are very, very, very bad. And that's why Perak Aleph, Beis, and Dalet begin with the word Eicha, because in the first base of Mikdash they violated the 36 Chayav Ekrisais. By the second base of Mikdash, they didn't violate no Chayav Ekrisais. They didn't. The Gemara says they learned Torah, they were, they were Isaac Batar, Vigimilas Chasadim. They didn't violate any Chayav Ekrisais. The only thing they did is they did this little Avera called Sinas Chinam. Therefore, the Psukim are very short. Therefore, it does, Paragimel, the Pesukim are very short. It doesn't begin with Eicha. But they did it again and again and again and again. Therefore, each letter of the Alephes has three Pesukim. To teach, says the Gemara, that Lalamed Sheshkula Sinas Chinam Keneged Avodah Zara Gila Raya Sashvichas Damim That in fact, Sinas Chinam is equal to the big three. But be it as it may, the Gemara says that we violated all 22 letters of the Aleph Beis, and therefore Eicha has 22 letters in each Pasuk. Says Reb Tzadik HaKoyin, Ah, oh, if the Gemara is saying that because we violated the 22 letters of the Aleph Beis, we're punished with 22 letters in Eicha. Probably, says Reb Tzadik, that's why there are 22 days in the three weeks. Because if the reason we were punished with Eicha, 22 letters of Eicha, is because we violated all the 22 letters of the Aleph base, probably that's why there are 22 days of the three weeks to rectify all the letters of the Aleph base that we, uh, we destroyed, we violated. But maybe there's another way to look at it. So I'm close with um, a big Talmud Chacham in Aris Yisrael, with Pinchas Friedman. He wrote uh, volumes called Shvilei Pinchas. He's the Rosh Kailal of Bells. He's a tremendous Baal Shava. And uh, last year he sent me, I, I asked him, you know, how do you compose your pieces? So he said, you know, Daniel, let me, I'll, I'll give you a little uh, taste. So in the beginning of the week he sent me his Maimer, like a draft. He's actually flying from America to Eretz Yisrael. And then on Monday he sent me like a second edition. And then the next day he sent me the third edition. And the fourth edition he wrote, he said on the plane, Bein Shamayim Va'aretz, between heaven and earth. The Medrash says, it's found in a number of places, I brought it on the sheet in number 14 and 15, that when Moshe Rabbeinu broke the Luchais, so we, we, we imagine it, we, you know, he's holding the tablets, which were not rounded on the top. Good, they have it right over here, Okay. And he's holding it, and he was about to shatter it. And, you know, we picture that he shattered the luchais. No. The Medrash says that as he's about to shatter the luchais, they got heavier and heavier and heavier. You know why they got heavier and heavier? Because the letters of the luchais flew off. The letters flew off the luchais. Flying letters. Look at number 14. The words flew off. Look at number 15, the Yalkut Shemoni. Ulechol hayor achazaka, nistakel Moshe beluchos v'ra'ak, sabjem shepoireach. He saw the letters flew, v'kavdu al yadoi, and it got really heavy, and that's why they fell. So it's very possible then, that if the three weeks is sort of kicked off and triggered by the breaking of the luchos, and the luchos broke, how many letters of the Aleph Beis? 22 letters of the Aleph Beis. That's likely why there is a connection. There are 22 days of the three weeks. Because we're commemorating the breaking of the Torah on Shiva Asar Batamaz. We know the Medrash says when Moshe broke the Luchais, what happened? The Torah was forgotten. 
the Torah was forgotten. Had Moshe not broke the Luchas, the Torah would never be forgotten. That's why, what's the Avoid of Chodesh Tammuz? What does Tammuz stand for? Rav Nachman of Breslov says, Tammuz stands for Zichru Tairas Moshe. Remember the Torah, don't forget it. Because when Moshe took the Luchas, he shattered it. He brought Shikha to the world. The Avoidah of Tammuz is Zichru Tairas Moshe. So you say, what happened to the Vav? Doesn't Tammuz have a Vav? Says Rav Nachman, of course it has a Vav. But the Luchas were Vav by Vav and they broke. So we don't have to use the Vav in Tammuz. Or we could say Tammuz stands for Zman Matan Torah Seinu. That's when the Torah was given. Moshe tried to give us the Torah. It just it didn't work out. So from the moment Moshe took that, those Luchais and he shattered it and the letters went flying, we now are in Avelos. We're trying to retrieve those 22 letters. If we retrieve those 22 letters during the 528 hours of Tammuz by mastering Tar Shabbat and Tar Shabbat Peh, then that's the mafteach of Geula, that's the mafteach, that's the key of redemption. So again, now the question is, so why, what are the 21 days? 20, I thought he broke the luchas, and now all the letters of the Aleph Beis went flying. Says Hagoyin of Pinchas Friedman, Shlita, a, an incredible chap. Not so fast. Hold your horses. When Moshe broke those luchas, yes, all the letters went flying. But were all the letters written on the Luchais? Did the Luchais actually have all 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet? There's a famous Gemara in Baba Kama. It's almost inexplicable Gemara. We have no way to, uh, to understand it. But the Gemara says, if you look at number 17, Shoal Rabbi Chanina ben Ogil es Rabbi Chia bar Abba. Why does it say Taiv on the second Luchais and not on the first Luchais? You know, it does not say the word Taiv on the first Luchais. By the first Luchais it says, So you should live long. And by the Dibrois Achroinus, the Dibrois Shniyos, it says, Uleman Yitavlach. It doesn't say Taiv by the Luchais Shniyos. Now, in between, the Gemara says, Really? Why are you asking me why it says Taiv? You should ask me if it does say Taiv. Which seemingly is impossible to explain. Here you have an Amoira who doesn't know if it says the word Taiv in the, in the second Luchais. Look in a Chumash. How is it possible that you have a, a Torah sage who doesn't know a Pasuk in a Chumash? This is a Gemara. Everybody speaks about this Gemara. But I'm not, but I'm not going to speak about it today. But what the Gemara says openly is that by the second Luchais it says Taiv. By the first Luchais, it doesn't say Taiv. Says the Gemara, you know why it doesn't say Taiv by the first Luchais? Because Taiv is good. And when God says good, it means absolute good, total good, perfect good. Like Chazal say, Ain Taiv Ela Taira. If Moshe would have taken that word Taiv, and he would have shattered the word Taiv, then we never would be able to have taiv again in our history. So the Rivan Shalom purposely omitted the word taiv, because if it would have said taiv on the luchais, and Moshe would have broke the luchais, then taiv would have gone down the drain forever and ever and ever. Says the Gemara, I have to read to you the words. You should be familiar with these words. Amar Rav Ashi, at the end of number 17. Chas v'shalayim paska taiva mi Yisrael. Because the Gemara says, the reason it doesn't say Taiv on the first Luchais is Soifan Lehishtaber. It's eventually going to be broken. So Gemara says, V'chi Soifan Lehishtaber, am I happy? Who cares if it's eventually going to be broken? Says Ravashi, you can't break the Taiv! If you break the Taiv, Taiv goes down the drain. The Bnei Yisosra has an incredible remez. So what day did Moshe break the Luchais? What day of Tammuz? 17. 17 is Gematria. Taiv! You know what's toiv about the 17th day of Tammuz? That it didn't say toiv on the Luchais. Sometimes what's toiv is not toiv. And what is toiv is not. 
You know why the luchas were broken on the day of Taiv, on the day of 17? Because it was so Taiv that it didn't say Taiv. So in order to preserve Taiv forever and ever and ever, Hashem had Moshe break a luchas that doesn't have Taiv on it. What was Taiv was the fact that there's no Taiv on the luchas. So it comes out then, then how many letters were written on the luchas? Huh. Only 21 letters were written on the luchas. How many letters were broken off the luchas? 21 letters on the luchas. What do you mean? 20, no, the letter test did not appear on the luchas. The Chsam Soifer has a beautiful drush. Parak Ayin Gimel Tehillim, number 19. Mizmar Asaf. Ach, Toiv Li Yisrael. Ach is 21. Aleph Chaf. 21. The fact that there are only 21 letters on the luchas, Toiv Li Yisrael. That's good for the Jewish people. Because if there would have been 22 letters on the Luchais, that would have been Rali Yisrael. Because that means that Toiv would have gone down the drain. So it comes out then that if we would ascribe, if we, if we would ascribe each letter of the Hebrew alphabet to a different day of the three weeks, after all, that's what Rabbi Tzadik HaKain says, that each letter of the, of the Hebrew alphabet corresponds to another day of the three weeks then is it possible to say that what letter corresponds to Tisha B'av, the ninth day of Tam, of Av, the letter Tess, the letter that was never broken, the letter that survived, the letter that wasn't even there to begin with, the letter that Moshe Rabbeinu couldn't break, because if he would have broke it, then all hope would have been lost. In fact, that means the day that Moshe broke the Luchais is a very hopeful day, because the Rebbe Hashem orchestrated that, and ensured that our ultimate salvation would never go down the drain. In fact, what Pinchas Friedman said, it could be that's why Moshe knew he was allowed to break the Luchais. You know, Moshe looks at the Luchais. He says, should I break this? Should I not break this? This is not going to be good for the Jewish people if I break the Luchais. And Moshe Rabbeinu starts looking at the letters of the Luchais. And he sees the Aleph, and he sees the Beis, and he sees the Gimel. And he, sees, he says, there's no tests over here. Wait a second, if there's no test and I break it, there's still hope for rejuvenation. Oh, must be. The Rebbe Hashem Bedafka didn't put a test. He's allowing me to break it because there'll still be hope if I break the Luchais. What gave Moshe Rabbeinu the clue that he could break the Luchais is the fact that the letter test is conspicuously absent. You know, the Gemara says in Baba Kama, if you see the letter Tess in a dream, let's say during the year now, you doze off a little bit, or even not now, any time, you know. Let's say, you know, you know there's a guy who, um, every time the rabbi got up to speak, within minutes, the guy was out cold. Like, the rabbi could be like two minutes into the drasha, the guy was like out snoring. And one time, the rabbi was like walking up to the podium, and the guy was already out cold. The rabbi got so he said, you're already sleeping. He said, Rabbi, I trust you. <laughs> but anyway, the Gemara says in Baba Kama, the Gemara says, if you see a test in a dream, it's a simon taiv. It's a good simon. It's a good simon. It's a simon of taiv. Says the Maral, the Gemara says, when is the best time of existence? You know, in our, in our existence, in any stage, Eoiv says, I wish I could go back to the good old days. You know, what are the good old days? The good old days are in utero. When the Gemara says, a Malach comes and teaches a person, Kula. And the Gemara says that a person's eyes are closed. Says the Gemara. If you look at number 25, There's no greater day of taiva. There are no better days of taiva than during the nine months that a person is in utero. Listen to this description of the Gemara. The Gemara says how wonderful it is. Um, the Gemara says, uh, says the Gemara, You want to know what taiva is? In utero. 
Says the Maral, you think it's coincidence that the greatest toiva in the world is for how long? Nine months? It's not a coincidence. There's a reason why the greatest type in the world is for nine months. What letter is mayor? What letter is predominant during the nine months of of uh, of of Ibor? The letter test. In other words, if you could take a sonogram, it doesn't come up. I've seen sonograms that they were not able to capture a letter test. They they don't they don't know what they're looking for. But if you got a really good view, you would see that b'mei imay the letter test was is mayor on the baby through the letter test, which is. Through that, it's melamed kol kula. Meaning the possibility to know the entirety of the Torah is through the letter test. So when the Gemara says that if the letter test was broken on the Luchais, then we would have lost Torah forever, that means we never would have been able to retrieve the forgotten Torah that was caused by Moshe breaking the Luchais. So Moshe broke the Luchais. But the good news is the letter Tess is never broken. Through the letter Tess, everything can be restored. There are 22 days of the three weeks, but there's one letter and one day that retains its ability to restore everything for the Jewish people. And that's the ninth day of Av. The ninth day of Av is Kenegah, the Ois Tess. The ice test, which is mayor in the nine months of pregnancy, the ice test that through that ice test we could retrieve all the Torah that was forgotten through the Shviras Haluchais. So Moshe breaks the Luchais on the first of the day of the three weeks, but he understands that the Yavon Shalom is saving for us the ninth day. Now, the ninth day of, Ta- of, T- of Av is a tragic day. The first base of was destroyed, the second base of was destroyed. But latent in that day is the letter test. Let me tell you one last thing about the letter test. The Radvaz writes about the ice test. There's no ice in the Aleph base, which is a clay keeble like the ice test. Think about all the letters of the Aleph base. None of them have receptacles, they're either open or an opening on the right side, or the left side, or it's open on the bottom. Nothing could receive anything. So you could think of it two ways. Tisha B'av, which is Kenegah the Ois Tess, it's the bottomless pit. It's an endless day of tzara. All the Jewish tragedies keep on recurring again and again and again. It's like a pit that never ends. Yirmi Hanavi cursed the day of his birth, Tisha B'av. First Beis HaMikdash, second Beis HaMikdash, Beitar, Inquisition, but it's also a tremendous klikibo. It's also a tremendous receptacle. It also has tremendous possibility for bracha. And if we are able to connect to the ice test through the 528 hours of the three weeks, then we, ha- we, we are grateful to Yibbam Islam that he removed that ice test from the Luchai so that when all the letters of the Alephes were broken, that one is still preserved as the receptacle for us to pour into it all of our avoida and all of our preparations, may, be, may Hashem find our preparations, beratza in lefanav, we should be taka to restore the Torah that was forgotten and restore the binyan beis hamikdash, b'mher v'yamenu, amen. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.